after the ice is gone, would Earth proceed to the Venus Syndrome, a runaway greenhouse effect that would destroy all life on the planet, perhaps permanently. While all that is difficult to say based on present information, I've come to conclude that if we burn all reserves of oil, gas, and coal, there is a substantial chance we will initiate the runaway greenhouse. If we also burn the tar sands and tar shale, I believe the Venus Syndrome is a dead certainty. Skipping ahead. What will the world be like if we go down this route? The science tells us exactly what we could expect to happen on Earth if we continue our business as usual exploitation of fossil fuels. I've referred to it earlier, the Venus Syndrome. But how to portray the horror of that devastation in a way beyond graphs and numbers and phrases we have heard before, like climate disaster. Even though science fiction isn't my area of expertise, I use the following scenario as a clarion call. I must try to make clear the ultimate consequences if we push the climate system beyond tipping points, beyond the point of no return. It's not Earth. It's not Earth. What do you mean it's not Earth? The whole planet is covered by haze. It can't be Earth. The guidance system must have gone haywire. Maybe it's Venus, but it doesn't look like Venus. Calm down, Spud. It has to be Earth. We checked the coordinates as we were slowing down as we approached the solar system. Mayflower 2 was on track to the third planet from the sun, just as it was programmed. This can't be the planet we have been studying for the last 10 years. It's nothing like it. Focus the viewer on it and put the image on the screen so we can all see it. There. It's not the blue marble. The atmosphere is full of a yellowish dust or haze. You can just barely see through to some surface features. We're supposed to be looping in over the South Pole, right? That must be Antarctica. Yes, it seems to have more or less the right shape. It must be Antarctica. But I don't see any ice. What should we do, Pa? We need measurements. Use the polarizing spectrometer so we know what we're looking at. Mayflower 2 left Claron almost five centuries ago. The spaceship had seven crew members, five human-like creatures, and two robots or droids. Mayflower 2 was carrying the hope, probably the last hope, for the survival of the Claronian civilization. Claron was the only planet in its solar system with life. Life developed on Claron long before it did on Earth, and it is far more advanced by about half a billion years. For millions of years, Claronians had searched the skies for other intelligent life or any life. They had long since concluded that they must be unique. The only intelligent life within range, or at least the only life that had developed electromagnetic technology, 
that would allow interstellar communications. They had built extremely sensitive radio receivers with a receiving area of thousands of square kilometers. Yet century after century, they came up empty. They poured more and more resources into the search for life. They had a good reason. The star that Clairon circled was a fairly standard main sequence star, somewhat bigger and older than Earth's sun. So it was burning its hydrogen faster, and its radius was expanding more and more. As the star moved closer to reaching its red giant phase, Claironians knew that their years were numbered. They still had millions of years, perhaps, but for a civilization half a billion years old, it seemed like they were down to their last moments. Life on Clairon works pretty much the same as on Earth. Claronians and animals inhale oxygen, which is used in cellular respiration and exhale carbon dioxide. Plants use the carbon dioxide in photosynthesis and produce oxygen as a waste product. The Claronians are peaceful and cerebral creatures. Their lifespan is about 150 years. So their concern was not about their individual lives, but rather the fate of their civilization. Perhaps this was because they had so much time on their hands to think. Life had become easy after their technology had reached a point that their droids could do all the work, planting and harvesting the crops, construction, cleaning. For more than a hundred million years, the Claronians had kept their climate stable by steadily increasing the shielding of their planet from the light of their slowly brightening sun. They had long realized the need to keep both the amount of sunlight and the atmospheric composition in the proper ranges for their life processes. They could not reduce the carbon dioxide to make up for a brightening sun. But with their space technology, shielding the sunlight was not difficult. They put reflecting pellets in orbit about their planet and added more pellets as needed to keep the amount of sunlight within the range that they were adapted to. The problem was that as their sun expanded into the red giant phase, it would swallow Claron. For their civilization to survive, at least one breeding pair would need to escape to another habitable planet. But there was no other habitable planet in their solar system. Only two Jupiter-like gas ball planets, giant gas ball planets. Their hope was to find another solar system with a climate more like that of Claron. They had studied many planets around other stars. Two planets less than a light year away had spectra suggesting plant life. Claronians worked for millions of years to develop their spacefaring capabilities. Eventually they were able to send missions to the two green planets and also to several lifeless planets. The first missions were carried out with droids, which could survive accelerations to hyperspeed and long journeys without life support systems. The droids found that life on the two green planets had not advanced beyond 
algae like slime, perhaps similar to life on Earth a billion years ago. Many attempts were made to transplant Claronian life to both of the green planets and to the lifeless planets. All missions failed. The closest they had come to success was establishing colonies of Claronians on these planets within space capsules on the surface. The spacecraft had carried Claronian eggs and sperm as well as seeds for plant life. And while the droids had been able to raise and educate several Claronians, they could not get other species to thrive. And the colonies soon died out. They were not able to manufacture a livable environment on another planet. Their failures were no wonder. How could they mimic a life support system that had taken billions of years to develop on their planet? Life on Claron was as complex as on Earth, with millions of interdependent species. Then, near the end of the 20th century, Earth time, Claronian society exploded with the news that radio signals had been detected from a distant source. It was not noise. The signals must have emanated from intelligent life at a great distance. The signals were mid-20th century radio signals from the Earth, located about 40 light years from Claron. Overnight, the study of Earth became the principal activity on Claron. Before long, there were more university students in Earth studies than any other subject. Claronian scientists realized from technical and educational television programs beamed from Earth that life there worked in basically the same way that it did on Claron. English began to be taught as a second language on Claron, with studies beginning in middle school. Television shows broadcast from Earth became popular entertainment. Earth news was reported daily in English 40 years after the events had occurred on Earth. In 2003, Claronians were dismayed to learn of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. While the Claronian public was becoming as acquainted with Earth's going, goings on as many Earthlings had ever been, their government began devoting enormous resources to planning and developing the mission to planet Earth. The distance to Earth was much greater than that of their prior missions. It would be an exceedingly difficult trip, despite their advanced technologies. Forty light years would take several centuries. Even using powerful acceleration to hyperspeed, which Claronians could not withstand. Though they had learned to recycle wastes during space travel, it was, an, it was implausible to carry Claronians on a trip of several centuries that would require multiple generations. Instead, they would use the technology developed for their failed attempts to transport life to the green planets and the dead planets. The spacecraft would carry droids and frozen Claronian eggs and sperm. The droids would be programmed to carry out the fertilization and serve as surrogate parents to the Claronian babies, as they had successfully done on prior missions. But this time, it seemed there would be no need to transplant or create entire life systems, other species and their ecologies, and create a livable environment, which is why Earth was so attractive 